Hi there. So I just wanted to mention this before I get started that um, this is where we start to hit the part where it starts to become infeasible for me to explain some of these concepts uh, in video form. Remember the original point of this shader series was to get people who have never done shader programming before started and some of these concepts start their approach to the limit of being just pretty insanely complicated and I wanted to keep this series as something that's simple and easy to understand for people that are getting started so for that reason this is probably going to be the last shader effect of this caliber that I cover in the video series just because I want to keep this stuff simple and I'm really showing this just to show you guys how cool this stuff can be but I don't want you to feel like you have to know these concepts like the back of your hand after watching this video in other words this video and sort of the last one are kind of for fun and just to show you guys what's possible. This is episode 10 of the Shader Dev series. Today we are going to be talking about parallax occlusion mapping, which is essentially an extension of bump mapping uh, for increased realism. So, where we left off last time essentially was this. We had a texture map effect that we wanted to be more realistic and we provided bumps or bumps from a file sometimes also called normal mapping to make the lighting calculation depend on digitized normals and we got a more realistic effect. However, this effect has limitations when you view the surface still at grazing angles because you are still shading essentially what is a flat surface. So if the normals are supposed to represent um, anything more than the most shallow bumps, the effect can get lost when you view the surface from grazing angles. So here's a recap of how bump mapping works. Essentially the light strikes the surface and the surface has a uh, predefined normal vector which is defined by the topology of the polygon. What we do with bump mapping is we take those normals and we retrieve them from a special bump map. So taking it a few steps further. Essentially what, where bump mapping leaves off is the fact that you are only providing a displacement or a change of the normals in the, uh, when you're shading the polygon. The underlying surface topology, which is essentially a flat triangular polygon, remains unchanged. So when the eye looks at the surface, it essentially is viewing the surface at a certain point, and that point is essentially always defined by the flat topology of the polygon. However, with parallax occlusion mapping, what you do is you provide a displacement map, sometimes also called a height map, and inside of there is essentially digitized displacements from the baseline flat polygon. When these are provided, what you can do is you can actually render and simulate a completely bumpy, complex topology over a single polygon, such that the eye will actually believe that they are seeing a complex surface as opposed to just a simple polygon. And those normals essentially from the bump mapping, that effect is augmented or in, it, realism is increased by adding this parallax occlusion effect on top of it. And the normals that are done from the, the bump mapping are essentially reflect or are uh, in agreement with the, um, the displacements provided. Now the way this works is the displacement map or the height map provides at every single point on the, uh, the texture map a specific value that is used as the height displacement from the baseline value of the surface. This stuff is complicated. I can just feel it as I'm explaining it. Um, so how essentially is this effect done? Well, the eye when it's looking at a certain piece on the surface is expecting to see light as if it was striking the flat edge of the broad side of the polygon. However, when you were doing parallax occlusion mapping, you use some information, num namely the number of samples you want to take at every pixel that you're shading, and a height scale, which affects basically how much um, how how much of the effect that um, the displacement has, essentially how how steep the uh, the parallax effect is. 
So as the eye is expecting to see that surface on a certain point, we essentially trick the eye by instead of shading the pixel as if it was right there on the surface, we instead shade it as if it was essentially offset by the value coming from the displacement map. Now there's a fun little trick that you can do with this. Essentially because the colors and the normals that you need to shade the surface are provided in the two other texture maps, namely the diffuse map for the color and the normal map for the normal vector. If you want to shade the surface as if the user was looking at that essentially increased height angle, what you need to do is calculate the color of where the surface would actually be as if you were looking at it from that point. In other words, you want to look at it as if the user was looking at the color that represents the same color as if viewed from an uh, increased height offset. And that little trick is essentially how parallax occlusion mapping works. Now I'm going to walk you guys through the shader code and how this effect essentially is done. However, just like in the last video, I want to give a disclaimer in that I am not a parallax occlusion, occlusion mapping expert. Um, this stuff is somewhat new to me as a concept and it's important that I say that because I might fumble when I go through some of the theory here because I've only actually been looking at um, how occlusion mapping works and the effect and the theory behind it really for like a couple of days now. So essentially what we're looking at here is where we left off last time with bump mapping. So we have a somewhat realistic effect that looks nice with respect to the light when it moves you can see that the bumps definitely respond to the light, but when you view it from a grazing angle, it starts to become more and more evident that this is really a flat surface and we are kind of tricking the, uh, the viewer with this bump mapping effect. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at parallax occlusion mapping here. And I'm going to walk you guys through the vertex shader first. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here for the specific reason that this is very similar to the vertex shader for bump mapping as well. In other words, a lot of the math here is done in the fragment shader because it's a fragment shader, predominantly a fragment shader effect. So essentially this is the same stuff that started with the bump map with slightly different variable names. For starters, we still use the normal, the tangent, and then the cross product of those two, which is the binormal, to provide a surface local coordinate transform, which essentially takes you from um, surface local space, here also referred to as tangent space, to world space where the calculation is actually done. That's essentially the same thing as it was before. Same thing with providing um, I, uh, the I vector, the normal vector, and the light vector essentially in um, starting originally with um, surface local space and then we transform back on the fragment shader. So over in the fragment shader um, you'll notice that essentially there's some new variables here. Uh, I, my plan was to expose these as uniforms, but I haven't really cleaned this up enough yet for me to do that. Um, but essentially what I have here is I have a height map scale, which is essentially how much the height map is multiplied by, um, which provides the uh, steepness or shallowness of the, um, the parallax occlusion effect. And then the maximum and minimum number of samples, which are determined probably by the viewing angle of the, um, of, of the user to the surface so that no more samples are taken than need to be taken because in the fragment shading world and in the shading world in general when you're doing multiple samples or multiple texture fetches per fragment it's one of the most expensive things you can do in a fragment shader and you always want to limit that if possible. Everything else we have up here is essentially the inputs from the vertex shader which gives you the texture coordinate, um, the eye coordinate position, uh, the normal vector and I believe this is the vector to the uh, single light that we are using here. Um, and we also have the world position of that light if we need that as well. Um, so we have three texture maps that we're using here. We have the, um, if I can find it, uh, there is a diffuse map somewhere. Um, texture zero, there it is. There is the bump texture from last time and then we have the new texture called the height texture which is our displacement map. And I've generated both the normal map and the height map from crazy, what was it called? crazy bump, uh, which I used last time, and it can generate both bump maps and normal or uh, displacement maps. So for starters, the first thing we do is essentially we get N, E, and L, which are uh, normalized vectors in, um, I think these come in in um, surface local space, 
And these essentially are the normal vector, the I vector, and the light vector. And uh, no, I, it, they're in world space. Um, so this is where the parallax occlusion stuff starts. Essentially, the first thing uh, from what I can discern is it takes a parallax limit, which is basically based off of the viewing angle between the, um, between the I vector and the surface itself. And that essentially provides a parallax limit, which is used to determine how far this effect is going to go. Don't know if I explained that perfectly. I might have gotten that a little bit wrong, but that's that's what I can discern from that. The number of samples essentially is taken as a um, as a com combination or a mixture between the minimum and maximum number of samples, as determined by the angle between the i vector and the normal vector. That's the part where basically determines how much of these samples need to be taken, depending on how much of a grazing angle you view the surface at. We're going to get into something I haven't showed you guys before, which is essentially DFDX and DFDY. These are essentially the gradient, the mathematical gradient of the texture coordinates, um, their derivatives, and this is used for essentially uh, anti-aliasing as done in shaders. You don't have to worry about these too much because we're actually not going to do anything with them except pass them directly to our texture fetch method, so I'm going to go ahead and skip that um, concept until we get down there. We have our current ray height, which is essentially our baseline for um, where the ray is starting or striking the surface. And then we just zero out our current offset and last, set last offset variables. And we also start out with our last sampled height and current sampled height, which also start out as one. So we start out with a current sample of zero. As I realized when I tried to port this to WebGL, this would actually work better as a for loop in a shader, but um, uh, the article that I ported this code from started with a while loop, but uh, the concept is essentially the same. This is the first time you guys have probably seen me show a while loop or a loop of any kind in a shader, and um, this, allows, this allows the effect to work. And basically what happens is for every sample it takes, it obtains the sampled height, which is the digitized height or digitized offset from the displacement map. And it obtains that from the height texture using the original text cord plus some offset, which is essentially the parallax offset as, as computed so far in the shader. Now you'll see, I believe that offset starts out as zero for the first sample. And it only takes R because this is essentially red, or it's a, it's a black and white texture image, so red, green, blue, it doesn't matter. Um, you just need the grayscale value, which is essentially a value between zero and one, representing a normalized offset. Uh, now here's where it gets interesting. DX and DY, remember I told you that these came in from DFDX and DFDY. These values are essentially the uh, texture coordinate gradient vector. Now you'll notice I'm calling texture grad here and I'm not calling texture straight up. What this allows me to do is I get to determine how mit mapping or um, sometimes called trilinear filtering is done by the texture map lookup. Usually the uh, texture function will do that for you, but it will assume, almost always correctly, that you want to do a simple texture map across a uh, perspective cor correct surface. However, we are overriding that. We are the ones that are actually providing the, um, the, uh, the texture lookup algorithm that needs to be used to determine whether or not we're viewing the surface from a grazing angle. So we pass in dx, dy, and essentially manually provide the gradient to the, uh, the texture lookup function. Uh, it's a really hard to explain that, but basically it's something that makes sure that the texture lookup happens correctly with respect to how we're looking at the, uh, the fragment. Um, after that, basically what we do is we have an if statement. We determine whether or not we are greater than our, uh, the sampled height is greater than the current ray, ray height, which essentially will quit the for loop, or we will take another sample and we will essentially march our way through the surface to determine a couple of things. Now I haven't done enough research to say exactly what this um, what this algorithm does, but I can tell you for a fact that it's making sure that it takes the correct sample, in other words the one that's closest to the eye, and the one that represents the um, the proper height value or the proper final color like I showed you in that slide for where the, the eye would be viewing the surface. Um, down the road in the future, I would like to provide a better um, a better dive into this while loop, but um, for the sake of how new some of this stuff is to me, this is probably the best I can explain it.
Um, essentially, though, once you provide that final um, offset value, which is essentially how much you offset from the original texture coordinate, everything else is just bump mapping after that. You take the color, um, you take the, the color from the diffuse color, which is essentially the uh, texture coordinate plus the offset, and you do the same thing with the final normal, and you basically have your um, you have your resultant um, normal and light. And after that, it's the same calculation I showed you in almost every one of these videos. N dot L, the dot product between the vector to the light and the normal vector, and um, that provides you with your diffuse color. And then it's just a simple multiplication. And after all that craziness, if I were to build this thing, you will see the effect is a lot more realistic than regular bump mapping by itself. And that really shows off when I move the light. And this is the part where I think I realized that I might have my light vector reversed. Um, it would be easy to fix that, but um, that's essentially um, parallax occlusion mapping. And um, before I end the video here, I'm just gonna go ahead and play around with some of these parameters so you guys can see what happens. Um, for starters, what happens if we drop the number of samples, you'll notice that the effect somewhat breaks down. Now you'll see here we're taking at most two samples and essentially what's going on here is we don't always get the right one because um, we're not essentially descending far enough down the surface when it's deep enough to make sure that we get the right, um, the right offset value. Now if I starts to look pretty nice. You can still see that stair step effect in some of the grazing spots. And of course, if I was to go the other way, I'll probably start to get slow on my um, laptop here, but you can see the effect looks really nice. And we can also take the height map scale and we can raise that. And you'll start to see that the, um, the number of samples is important to increase when you have um, a more steep surface. So that's essentially what happens when you uh, raise the height map scale. However, for bump mapping of these bricks, I found that 0.02 and 32 and 8 seem to work the best for um, providing the effect on my brick surface. So that's parallax occlusion mapping. Uh, it's essentially the most advanced effect that we are going to go through in the shader dev series before I, I move on to uh, post-processing or multi-pass rendering. Uh, I, I'm not an expert in it, as you guys probably already just realized, um, but I could, not, I could not end this series without showing you guys this effect because it really is cool. I mean, how far, how far we've come as far as... Um, computer graphics engineers, um, the people that come up with this, it blows my mind how cool some of these concepts are and some of these little tricks they can use to make something as simple as a single polygon look this realistic. So um, that's parallax occlusion mapping and that's the end of this video. Thanks for watching guys.